welcome, welcome, welcome into this circle of community. Welcome into the space made sacred by Auckland Unitarians for 114 years. Be not tentative. Bring your whole self. Bring the joy that makes your heart sing. Bring your kindness and your compassion. Bring your, also your sorrow, your pain. Bring your brokenness and your disappointments. Spirit of love and mystery, help us to recognize the spark of the divine that resides within each of us. May we know the joy of wholeness. May we know the joy of being together. My opening words uh, are by Peter Fleck, who writes this in his book, uh, in his book entitled The Blessings of Imperfection. In his book, The Medusa and the Snail, the biologist Lewis Thomas observes that we humans are built to make mistakes, coded for error, that is, for being imperfect. We learn, as we say, by trial and error. Why, why not trial and rightness, or trial and triumph? And he concludes, the old phrase puts it that way because that is, in real life, the way it is done. In other words, progress requires error. What persuasive reasoning our, our response to our imperfection, he seems to say, is the very thing that can make us more perfect. This principle does not apply to humans only. It permeates creation. It is the very stuff of which evolution is made. Take the amphibians. The first one that crawled out of the water onto the land may not have done so because it its feet were so strong, but because its gills were so weak. The imperfection of its gills made that first amphibian into an animal of a higher order. But one could imagine its parents' distress at having a child that was so conspicuously unable to live a normal aquatic life. <laughs> a child with which there was obviously something wrong and one can imagine how it was jeered at by its peers. Nor did that first amphibian have any idea of what was happening to it. It had no idea that its wrongness had led into a betterness. Clay walks around with his tablet. Oh, it's moved from one side to the other, Clay. I don't know if I can handle this. And, I, I, and I've got paper. Do people remember that? How quaint. We had a speaker on Sunday who, who spoke from paper. Um, I want to uh, first of all mention about uh, my late wife, Linda. Uh, she was diagnosed on... Uh, I was home, she'd gone to the doctor, she came back from the doctor, she walked in the door, just sort of like a statue and said, I have cancer. That was on the 6th of June, 1995. And after specialist examinations, it was confirmed not only that she had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but she had a very aggressive form of it. And she died a year and a week later, which was 
20 uh, years ago today. Linda and I met in theological school, and after graduation, we always worked together as co-ministers. And on this list that we made of, of uh, ministers' roles, Linda was the educator. That was her A-plus thing. And that includes, you've got a Sunday school. We had a larger Sunday school. So you've got teachers, you've got curriculum to get, you've got organized teachers, you have to train them, you have to get feedback, how did it go today, you have to know the parents and the children. There's adult education, which Clay is doing now, setting up those programs, what's going to work for this group, and so forth and so on. So there's a, there's a whole lot to that job, okay? It's not, yeah, okay. Linda was very experienced and good at it. She'd worked at the largest Unitarian Universalist church in Chicago. She was on a number of denominational education committees. She was respected by her peers. And her master's thesis on religious education, which was written more than 40 years ago, is still on the required reading list for candidates for the Unitarian Universalist Ministry of Education. So Linda did an A-plus job in education. And she had other jobs that she did well, too. Fellowship. She was organizing, uh, or organizing dinners and social events. Membership. She organized a greeters group and did the follow-up. You know, you contact people after they've been here, get their name and phone number and so forth. Music. She organized, uh, well, a choir. But we called it, not to offend the sensibilities of the humanists, we called it a singing group. Okay, but we had a choir for a while, okay, and she was largely responsible for that, for, for organizing. And the newsletter, she and I did it together, but she did more than I did in terms of being the editor and so forth. And management, which was referred to. Management is one of the unseen things around the church, and it's awfully important. And I guess the way to describe it is to say, Ministers have experience, okay? This is a job we've been doing for quite a long time, and we've worked in quite a number of churches and seen different situations. Clay, how many churches have you worked in, do you think? Seven. Seven? Yeah, and some of them have been good-sized churches, big churches. So the man has seen, I won't say he's seen it all, but he's seen many, many different types of situations, okay? And I have also experienced. And so guiding the management committee and offering suggestions is extremely important. And then another side of management is the follow-up. You know, it was a great idea we had last month. Anything happened? No. Nope. Let's move on to the next subject. Okay? So that's another side of management. Let's make sure it actually gets done. Linda also managed me. I don't think that was as big a job as managing the managing management committee. But anyhow. Um, and, and regarding the question about preachers and administrators, I'm very bad at delegating. Okay, And so Linda used to say, Max, if somebody else does it, they won't do as good a job as you would do. And that's all right. And that's all right. Okay? <laughs> it's a very important message for me to let go and let other people do things. And some of you probably wouldn't hurt from hearing that message either. When she retired, when, she, when Linda died, uh, I also retired as co-minister here. I was suddenly a solo parent with two teenagers. Uh, there was only one thing on my mind, and I couldn't imagine how I was going to give a sermon on anything except death, dying, and bereavement. And I couldn't imagine doing this job without the support of my co-minister. Okay, because she had done so much of, of, of the work around here. So when Linda died, the church lost 
Two ministers, not one, two. Linda and I had a failing, which I deeply regret. We had done little succession planning for the church, and I apologize to you for that. The most important thing we hadn't done was we didn't raise our salary so that there would be a level of giving that would enable the church to comfortably hire another, another minister. We'd been in business and sold the business, and we didn't need a big salary. It was a small group, and we blah, 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 so we didn't want to seem greedy and ask for a proper salary. Well, you know, that was not a very smart thing to do. I regret it, but that's the way it happened. So, today, you and I have to make that right. Uh, David Fougere and maybe you others uh, secured funding to pay our minister, but the funds are finite and they're going to run out and they're diminishing each year by $10,000. Okay? And we have to somehow pick up that difference through a larger membership, through more giving, through more fundraising and the like. Now, I'm prepared to do and help in ways that I can so that we become more self-funding. And I'll ask you to do the same, uh, to try to. Uh, Clay's good at this. He needs our help. Okay? So please keep that in mind. People say, oh, Max and Linda had a, you know, did a great ministry here. Yeah, we did it on the cheap, and we're paying for it now in trying to raise the money that we need to have a proper minister with a living wage. Ah, with a living wage, right, Rachel? That's the one. <laughs> Now, what I am going to do now is going to appear to be a sudden academic detour. But trust me, it all fits together. We'll come back to where we were a few minutes ago. So pay attention. There will be a quiz. The Lonely Crowd is a book written by David Reisman in 1950, and it's a classic in sociology. He identified three main cultural types in the United States, but common here too tradition-directed people, inner-directed people, and other-directed people. Now, tradition-directed social types obey the rules that were established long ago. Why do you do it this way? Because we always have, because that's our tradition. Now, with the Industrial Revolution, society has arose where people were more inner-directed, they discovered potential within themselves. Interdirected people live as adults what they have learned in childhood. They tend to be confident and sometimes rigid because, you know, I know what I want. And we see this transition from tradition directed to inner directed in the whole metamorphosis in the economy. I mean, Henry Ford built cars on an assembly line not because it was traditional, it was completely not non-traditional. But something inside him said, I can do this. I'm going to do this. Of course, there were thousands of people who had the same feeling and didn't become Henry Ford's, but the direction came from inside oneself. After the Industrial Revolution had succeeded in developing a middle class, things changed. Instead of living according to, 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 to according to traditions or conforming to values of organized religion, of family or social codes, the new middle class gradually adapted a malleability in the way people lived with each other. The increasing ability to consume goods and, 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 uh, and the afforded Material abundance was accompanied by a, swift, a shift away from tradition and inner directedness. And Reisman called this malleability other directed people. Other directedness took hold as social forces of how other, others, where we look to other people to see what they consume what they did with their time, what their views are towards politics and play and work, how much they would dare to go into debt, and so on. Other directed people are flexible 
and willing to accommodate to others in order to gain approval. The other directed person wants to be loved rather than esteemed. They don't necessarily want to control others, they want to relate to them. And the other directed uh, need assurance that they are emotionally in tune with other people. So, since other directed people can only identify themselves through reference to other people and what other people earn and consume and believe in, they are inherently restricted in their ability to know themselves. The lonely crowd argues that society dominated by other directed uh, people faces profound deficiencies in leadership, individual self-knowledge, and human potential. Okay, the quiz. No, don't have time for a quiz. Okay, I'm sorry that's academically a little thick. I tried to, but okay. Uh, The main thing to remember is that other directed people can only identify themselves by looking at the people around them, what others do and earn and say and consume and so forth. They have great difficulty in knowing who they are or having their own values and goals. Part three. We were down at the cemetery visiting Linda's grave, the family was. And my son Derek, who was about 19, wandered off. And uh, after a while he came back. And I said, "Uh, where were you? And he said, "Uh, oh, I was over there visiting so-and-so's grave. It was one of his school friends, I knew him. And I was there visiting Diana Manning's grave, and she was a neighbor, and her two sons were friends with my son Derek. And I was over there visiting so-and-so's grave, another one of Derek's school friends. All three had committed suicide. And Derek had only been in New Zealand six or seven years at the time, okay? Back where we began our list of things ministers are expected to be able to do, the question arises, what expectations, what ideas of perfection did these people have of themselves? To what degree did they look at their own list and say, I have to do an A-plus job of everything, rather than saying, no, I don't have to. So another quote I want to share from you this morning comes from an accountant, my accountant. I hate to do my taxes. Every year the process drags on and on. And my accountant said to me, Max, don't let perfection get in the way of the good. Important message. I started a model railroad about 10 or 12 years ago. If I didn't let perfection get in the way of the good, that railroad would have been finished ages ago. Okay? But sometimes we lose lose track of what is the ultimate goal, what is really important in life. These three people who had committed suicide were part of the lonely crowd. They didn't know who they were. Life is good but they thought they were failures. When I was 10 years old, we moved to a new town, and that meant a new school system. In the United States, they don't have the same school system and and curricula every place. It varies from place to place. I was 10 years old. I could barely read, and the principal called my parents in for a conference. He wanted to put me back a grade. Well, my mother, some of you knew her, was an inner-directed person. She had very, yeah, right, smile and laugh. She was. She had very clear values and ideas. But she knew what she was doing. She said, he's bright at everything else, isn't he? Oh, yes, yes, he is, said the principal. Leave him where he is. He'll read when he's good and ready. That was her being interdirected, but it was also a message to me. Don't feel you have to be pressured to read until you're ready to do it. The time will come, and when it's ready, you'll do it. 
Noam Chomsky is a model of mine because of, I think of him as an inner directed intellectual. That no matter how much spin the politicians try to put on it, he brings it back to much more basic reality and fundamentals. Well, our culture's image of the ideal human being comes from its myths and its religions. In the back of my high school bus, it was sometimes a hotbed of debate in politics and religion. And uh, those debates really turned me off to traditional Christianity because I listened to the other young people around me. Uh, the things they were saying didn't make a whole lot of sense or impact on me. Jesus died for your sins. Hey, I didn't ask him to. Besides, I'm only 14. I haven't had a chance to do any serious sinning yet. Jesus was born of a virgin. Oh, really? Are you sure the father wasn't Peter Pan? Jesus performed miracles. He turned water into wine. Ha, huh. Houdini did that too. Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the dead. Houdini tried that and he didn't make it. There was this inconsistency about the image of Jesus. He was loving and generous. He was also a troublemaker and a revolutionary. Uh, I had to think, if Jesus was perfect, how come his followers have split into these fragmented groups that have gone around killing each other and killing other people for thousands of, <clears throat> for thousands of years? Or, as Woody Allen said, if there is a God, he's an underachiever. <laughs> All religions provide guidelines about what we should do and not do. Thou shalt not this, and so forth and so on. Pray five days, uh, five times a day to Mecca, and so forth. This is a framework for ethics, for rules and regulations about life. But the image of perfection, of how to be the perfect person, comes from the stories describing the life of a great religious leader, invariably a man. For Islam, it's Muhammad. For Judaism, several men, Moses, Solomon, David, prophets. For Buddhism, the Prince Siddhartha, who became the Enlightened One, the Buddha. And of course, for Christianity, the ideal person is Jesus. So what do I glean from these ideal people that we are supposed to emulate? Well, the important thing for me is that they all seem to have had a transforming experience, what we call in psychology a religious experience. And a religious experience is very personal. It's not a behavior that you or I can copy and get the same results. We can create the conditions so it may happen. We can pray, we can meditate, we can do yoga, we can go on a retreat, we can sing, chant, dance like whirling dervishes. But we can't be sure that it will happen. What happens and how it happens is a mystery. But religious experiences are life-changing. They reshape one's understanding of the meaning of life. They're more than intellectual, though. They are emotional. There's a feeling of inner peace and harmony, a feeling of liberation, of letting go. And at the same time, there is a feeling of embracing the world. There is no adequate description for what a religious experience is. It's just unplanned, and it's, well, it's an experience. You can't scientifically repeat it or write it down and say, here's the formula. But the result of religious experiences is a major reorientation of the person. And they become the great religious leaders who we emulate. I think perfection is not so much about trying to copy or do certain things, but it's about having these experiences. Uh, we may not have a completely life-transforming experience, but we pray, we meditate, and in the process we withdraw from the world to some degree, 
and we become more focused and more centered. We have a greater clarity of purpose. People who have had religious experiences are unmoved by fads and shallow values. They don't chase after meaningless possessions. We live in a very noisy world, not just noisy in terms of sound vibrations, noisy in terms of cheap, empty opinions. In the movie, Wall Street, Money Never Sleeps. There's a large room filled with very wealthy and well-heeled uh, uh, admirers of Gordon Gecko, who was played by Michael Douglas, and they have made fortunes, tons of money, uh, playing the money game on Wall Street. And Michael Douglas declares, he says, the point is, ladies and gentlemen, that greed, for want of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. And the crowd erupts in joyous approval and cheering. The lonely crowd. And we must not let them rule our society. I close with a meditation from David Rankin. It's called Incarnation. I met him in 1962 in Mount Vernon, Iowa. He was not a good planner two hours late for the appointment and unaware of the location. He was not a commanding presence, short in stature and ungainly in movement. He was not a handsome figure, slightly overweight and clothes too small for the body. He was not a congenial person, impatient in conversation, never fully present. He was not a great speaker, words lost in the, mo in the nose and ill-timed gestures. He was not a creative individual, ideas borrowed from others, frequent repetition. He was not a happy character, wide, mournful eyes and lips not made for smiling. But if God appeared anywhere, in the 20th century, it was in the form of Martin Luther King, Jr. We have come together to share our deepest concerns, speaking and singing words of inspiration, and hope. We have committed ourselves to do what we can to ease the burdens of those who suffer, to stand for decency and compassion. We have pledged to work for a more wholesome environment for us and for all the generations that will fall. But these are just words. The hymns we sing are just songs. All our reflections are just idle thoughts. When we convert them all into loving and responsible action throughout the week, then, and only then, will this morning become what we want it to be, a time of worship.